Welcome to Babel Translating the Middle East, a podcast from the Middle East program at CSIS. Here on Babel, we take you beyond the headlines to take a closer look at what's happening in the Middle East and why it matters. This week on Babel, I speak with Dr. Lina Khatib, an associate fellow in the Middle East program at Chatham House, which she led for seven years and where we first met. Together, we discuss the escalation between Israel and Hezbollah, its regional impacts, and the emerging vacuum in Lebanese politics. Then I continue the conversation with Will Todman and Leah Hickert to discuss the challenges of creating a comprehensive U.S. strategy in the Middle East and the ways great power competition affects the region's conflicts. To translate some of what's happening in the Middle East, this is Babel. Lina Khatib, welcome to Babel. Thank you for having me. Were you surprised at how quickly the Israeli confrontation with Hezbollah has escalated? Actually, it has not been a quick escalation. If you think about it, Hezbollah started launching rockets on Israel on October 8, 2023. And it took almost a year for this escalation to happen. And I think Hezbollah probably thought that it could go on practically indefinitely launching rockets at Israel with very few repercussions. And obviously, the calculations of both Hezbollah and Iran have been proven to be quite wrong in this regard. What are the immediate effects of the assassination of Hassan Nasrallah, who led Hezbollah for 35 years? This has been one of the biggest blows to Hezbollah morally. He's been in charge for 30 years, but the cultivation of the image has really taken off since 2006. So we're talking almost two decades of this person being presented as almost superhuman. And his image had been tightly linked to that of Hezbollah itself, so that in the eyes of many supporters of Hezbollah, Nasrallah represented strength, resilience, victory, all those qualities that Hezbollah wanted associated with itself. So at the moral level, having this figure eliminated is a huge blow. So that's in the near term. What do you think the longer term impacts are? I mean, we have to remember that Hezbollah ultimately is an institution and not a kind of small rogue group led by one charismatic guy. And although Nasrallah, as I said, had all those qualities, his loss can be compensated for at the level of operations. So I wouldn't dwell too much on Nasrallah himself. I would dwell on how Israel is trying to weaken Hezbollah as an institution. I think this is the bigger story here. And this is something that, of course, Israel is making a lot of progress regarding. However, Hezbollah is not an organization that can be dismantled with just military attacks. I want to come to the Israeli strategy in a moment, but I want to stay with the question of Lebanon, how this feels in Lebanon. How are Lebanese responding to the attacks on Hezbollah? My sense is some are celebrating it, some are mourning it. How would you break it down? The people who are against Hezbollah, and these are the majority in Lebanon, are not unhappy to see Hezbollah being weakened. However, they are not happy with the way Israel is doing it because it is done in a way that is bringing large-scale destruction to Lebanon, both physical and in terms of human casualties. And this is something that people are not on board with. So in a way, I wrote about this at one point saying people do not want to be liberated from Hezbollah at the hands of invaders. So they are feeling that they are kind of stuck in a really toxic dynamic. And people are also worried about potential tension inside Lebanon between Hezbollah supporters and those who do not support Hezbollah, partly because of the large number of displaced people in Lebanon who are sleeping on the streets, literally. And there is potential for social tension to flare up further down the line if this continues for a long period of time. And so people are being cautious not to celebrate publicly. And deep down, as I said, they are concerned. They're concerned about domestic stability more than anything else. And even Hezbollah's opponents recognize that Hezbollah as an organization cannot be just kind of canceled through military action. 
And so there is concern about the political future of Lebanon more than anything else. What do you see as Hezbollah's next move, given what's been happening for the last month? It's difficult to predict at this stage because Hezbollah is an organization that likes to save face. They do not like to be seen as having been defeated by Israel. So they will try to find a way out that saves face. But I'm not sure that Hezbollah is there yet. I think Hezbollah so far is able to operate in a decentralized manner with various small groups fighting Israel in the south without the need for central command coordination. And this can go on for a while. And I think Hezbollah is basically going to do this for as long as it feels it can. Ultimately, I would say the decision is not really Hezbollah's, it's Tehran's decision. And I think when Tehran starts feeling that the cost of continuing down this path has become higher than the gain, then it will try to find a face-saving way for Hezbollah to stop, such as the scenario that unfolded in the Iran-Iraq war in the 80s. Eventually, Iran at that time said, we're just going to have to, in a way, swallow the poison for the sake of the people. You know, this is the only scenario that I think Iran could use, as far as I can see, to kind of say, okay, this is why Hezbollah can now stop. But sadly, we're not there yet. What would that look like in terms of Hezbollah losing its patron, deciding to scale down, as you said, an expansive organization? Would that be a dramatic move portrayed as a modest move? Would it look like a collapse with everybody seeing it as a collapse? How would that unfold? This is the thing. Iran will not want it to look like a collapse. It will want it to be seen as a sacrifice for the sake of the people. In reality, of course, it's a significant weakening of Iran's regional influence because Hezbollah is the most important asset for Iran in the Middle East. And then I think there is the possibility that Hezbollah might find a compromise solution with the Lebanese state to turn it into an auxiliary military force, a bit like the popular mobilization forces in Iraq which are technically an auxiliary force reporting to the prime minister's office. Now, the difference with Hezbollah is it's regarded as a legitimate defense force by the Lebanese state, but it does not report to the state in any way. So it's given exceptional status. So if Iran is significantly weakened and still wants to have some influence in Lebanon, then it might have to accept this kind of lesser position for Hezbollah. And this would be the best case scenario further down the line. In terms of the Iranian perspective, not the best case scenario for Lebanon, of course, or for regional stability. Do you see a vacuum in Lebanese politics right now? And if you do, who could fill that vacuum and how would they fill it? This is the thing. This compromise that I'm talking about can only happen if Lebanon resurrects the political process to elect a president and have a proper cabinet in place, not just a caretaker cabinet as we have now in Lebanon. And this means there will be no vacuum. So you can't just have the Hezbollah solution, which is the Lebanonization solution, without sorting out the bigger political picture, because you need a cabinet and you need a president. So this cannot happen without international pressure. Iran is not going to just do this willingly. (laughs) I think it will only accept doing this if it feels it has no other choice. And here we go to what the United States wants to do about Iran, which I think is at the heart of the matter. I always say Hezbollah has been feeling so comfortable in Lebanon because, in general, U.S. foreign policy has been very complacent regarding Iran's regional influence in the Middle East. This has allowed Hezbollah to grow in influence and even expand its activities into Syria, allowed the Houthis to feel empowered, even the militias in Iraq. And I think if U.S. foreign policy basically changes so that we have a linkage between the Iranian nuclear file and the file of Iran's regional interventions, so that Iran can see that the only way a nuclear deal can be resurrected is if 
Iran agrees to these compromises at the level of its regional involvement, then we can have the scenario that I talked about apply in Lebanon. But again, this requires Washington to change its Iran policy. Is there a Gulf Arab state role here? And are Gulf Arab states willing to play a role here? I think Gulf states have been hoping for decades now that the United States would develop a comprehensive strategy regarding Iran. Because even though Saudi Arabia, for example, has had bilateral diplomatic relations restored with Iran, deep down, the worry is still there that Iran is a spoiler. And ultimately, Iran continues, for example, to support the Houthis. And yes, the Houthis are no longer attacking Saudi Arabia, but this is not a long-term solution. So they are looking for a long-term solution beyond de-escalation. De-escalation is not the answer. De-escalation is just because they need to pursue their economic projects and don't want the headache of Iranian missiles landing on them. But this is not a solution. And I think they definitely will be on board if Washington develops this comprehensive strategy that I mentioned. If I could ask you to put yourself in the mindset of the Iranians, what choices do you think they think they have? The Iranians at the moment see that the costs are mounting. However, they don't yet feel pressured enough to engage in any radical change in terms of their behavior in the Middle East. They feel that they have incurred huge losses in the past and were able to withstand those losses, and were able to rebuild. So they are still, I think, a bit hopeful that they can kind of get through this. An example is 2006. Although Hezbollah declared victory against Israel at that time, the reality is that the war ended in a stalemate, and Hezbollah incurred huge losses. But it managed to recoup these losses eventually, and it managed to become even stronger militarily and politically afterwards. So Iran is not yet feeling the heat. And the other issue for Iran is it wants to obviously protect its nuclear program. I think Iran will feel it really needs to change its behavior once it feels that its nuclear program is really threatened and also its regional influence is no longer going to be recoverable in the future after being weakened. What would create that circumstance? Diplomacy. <laughs> a lot of people, when I talk about Iran, assume that I'm calling for bombing Iran, and I don't think that's the answer. I go back to the nuclear negotiations. The nuclear program is very important for Iran. And if it feels that its regional investment in the Middle East is starting to wane, then that will make it adhere even more strongly to wanting to have a nuclear program in place because it feels it needs something to kind of build its projection of power on. And so if these two issues are linked, as I said, if Iran is presented with a concrete deal that says, we will have a nuclear deal with you if you agree to moderate your behavior in terms of all these proxies you're supporting. And if this is coupled, as I said, with a process for Lebanon, for example, as well as, you know, resurrecting the peace talks in Yemen with the Houthis. So what I'm saying is it's actually very complicated to really sort out Lebanon and Hezbollah. You need to sort out the Iranian issue. And to sort out the Iranian issue, you need to sort out its involvement in multiple countries and have all these processes run simultaneously. You can't anymore compartmentalize the Yemen issue and the Lebanon issue and the Syria issue. And so we're talking a huge shift in the balance of power in the Middle East. And this is not going to be something that will happen overnight. So none of what I'm talking about is something that can be achieved in a short period of time at all. It'll probably be something that the new U.S. administration will spend the duration of the administration working on. But I think we can't, as an international community, afford to live with the status quo. We've seen what living with the status quo has brought us. It's brought us basically instability that is only growing in the Middle East. So it's now time, I think, for a reset. And this is what I'm talking about. What does a nuclear deal look like at a time of renewed great power competition. We 
can't count on the Russians playing a constructive role, and it may be a leap to count on the Chinese playing a constructive role. How much does that complicate what you're calling for? They're not going to be actors you can depend on. But one thing is playing out in Syria at the moment, which is Russia's influence there and how important it is for Russia to kind of have long-term influence in that region. It's really unfortunate that Syria is in a way stuck between having to be under Iranian influence or Russian influence. This is, you know, not, neither is a good solution, frankly. But under the circumstances, again, dealing with Russia is not about just the nuclear issue. Again, it has to be about Russia's influence in the region as a whole. And that's a whole other headache for the United States, especially with Ukraine still going on in the background. And so you might get a compromise from Russia on one thing, but Russia will want something else in return. And I expect that that thing in return that Russia will want is to have long-term kind of presence on the Mediterranean. And that means, sadly, a bleak picture for Syria because it means continued Russian influence in Syria. Again, I'm not saying the future is positive. It's just a matter of what is the least bad scenario. When we talk about least bad scenarios, one of them is that the conflict between Israel and Lebanon stays contained. Do you expect it to stay contained, or do you think we still have some expansion in this conflict to go? I think it's highly likely that Israel is going to expand its military campaign. It's not likely that Hezbollah is able to do much more than what it has done now, simply because of the issue of communications network compromise due to Israel's infiltration. This means that Hezbollah will be very limited in being able to plan complex, large-scale military operations. But Israel, I think, is trying to inflict as high a cost as possible on Hezbollah in Lebanon. And it is going after Hezbollah's assets, even soft ones, from what I can tell, across Lebanon. And this means an expansion of the military campaign, which, of course, is bad news for Lebanon because many civilians are dying as a result of this. The infrastructure was already weak and it's now being devastated and the country is bankrupt. And so for Lebanon to recover from what has already happened is already very difficult. So with the expansion, it's going to be very, very, very tough for Lebanese recovery further down the line. Overall, is it your sense that Netanyahu is calculating correctly or incorrectly as he thinks about military action in Lebanon? I think he's calculating incorrectly because for a while, Israel was quite strategic in its actions in Lebanon, although, of course, collateral damage was sadly there, killing civilians. However, when Israel was targeting Hezbollah commanders, killing around 500 and targeted attacks, the pagers attack. These things did not translate to wide-scale destruction in Lebanon. And now we have a different scenario in which I feel that Netanyahu's ego is probably leading him to overextend. I think the ground invasion was not a good idea because even though Israel is saying this is easier than we expected, the fact is Hezbollah still has very strong networks in the South and has a lot of experience in dealing with ground fighting. And this is something that Israel will find difficult to kind of claim victory in. And also the attacks on the United Nations peacekeeping forces in Lebanon, attacks on rescue workers in Lebanon who are not affiliated with Hezbollah, hitting civilian targets that are not all connected with Hezbollah, things like planting the Israeli flag in the Iran garden that Iran had given funding for after 2006. I mean, it's not necessary. It just provoked people in Lebanon. Even people who hate Hezbollah felt that this is insulting to have basically the flag of another country being raised in Lebanon. So there are many moves that are now being done, both military and symbolic, that are just not boding well for the future. I mean, Netanyahu 
makes a statement saying the fight is with Hezbollah, not the Lebanese people, but at the same time conducts acts that are alienating the Lebanese people who would have maybe further down the line agreed to having peace with Israel. If there's one constructive thing that the United States can and should do in the near term, what do you think would be? Oh, definitely talk to Israel. I mean, of course, Biden and Netanyahu are talking, but I feel that right now Netanyahu is trying to do as much as he can while he can before the administration changes. And I think the current administration is frankly being a bit too complacent. And this is something that Netanyahu is kind of detecting. I think diplomatic pressure can increase on part of the U.S., Because I think this is the only thing that would stop this overextension that Israel is engaging in. And frankly, it is actually beneficial for Israel not to engage in overextension. So if the U.S. increases pressure on Israel diplomatically, this ultimately works in Israel's interest. The hope is that there will be people in the Israeli government that can see that and will cooperate with the U.S. to kind of start to have some checks on Netanyahu's behavior. And if you were advising the transition team that's preparing the next administration to come in, what should they do before the inauguration on January 20th? And what should they prepare to do immediately after the new president takes office on January 20th to try to encourage a reconstitution of Lebanese politics on a more constructive lines? I think immediately there needs to be signaling that there is going to be a shift in policy regarding Iran and a shift in the way the United States deals with the Israel-Palestine issue. Because ultimately, these two files are now more interconnected than ever. And the only way for stability to happen in Lebanon or elsewhere in the region is for a new approach that looks at the linkages between the two files. So this is, I think, something that should happen as soon as the new president is announced. And then what should happen after is for this to be put into action. I think the old kind of compartmentalization of these two issues has not worked. And as I said, the compartmentalization of the nuclear Iran file and the regional intervention file has also not worked. So now is the time for an interconnected U.S. foreign policy regarding the Middle East. And I think if Israel hears this, Arab Gulf countries hear this, Lebanon hears this, and then action is taken to start implementing this kind of new phase, this would be beneficial to everyone in the region. And this would be very different from the 2006 scenario in which the U.S. administration talked about the birth pangs of a new Middle East, but ultimately that only brought further devastation to the region. So I think it's time for the new administration to show that it has learned from previous mistakes. Mina Khatib, thank you for joining us on Babel. Thank you. Always a pleasure. Dr. Khatib, called for a more comprehensive U.S. strategy toward the Middle East that combines a strategy toward Palestine with one toward Iran. What are the obstacles to such a strategy? I don't think the U.S. is very good at strategy in general. We have a system that is so often responding to so many different small demands that pulling back and thinking about how to integrate things is really, really hard. There are almost too many inputs coming from inside the system and from outside the system to really slim things down and come up with a single strategy. Iran is incredibly complicated for the U.S. government, both on a strategic level and a political level. And Israel is very complicated on a strategic level and a political level. So while I understand the desire that the world has on the outside, we want something really clear from the United States. There's a large part of me that worries that there are so many small details that have to be resolved all the time, that those particular issues are especially hard for the United States to come up with a strategy in the moment, let alone a strategy that can endure through four years of a presidential administration. 
And you say there are so many details that have to be worked out. There are also so many different actors involved in this. And so there are a lot of potential spoilers as well. So what might work for Hezbollah and Iran and even militias in Iraq might not work for Israel or might not work for Hamas. I mean, recently we've been seeing reports that Yahya Sinwar has become more fatalistic about his future and the future of Hamas and that he's even less willing to accept compromises in any kind of negotiations. So I think it's very difficult to align all of these different actors because also the openings, the windows of opportunity to push for compromises shift for these different actors at different times. As some get more powerful, they're less willing to compromise. I agree with Dr. Khatib that these different conflicts are becoming more interconnected, but I don't think that necessarily means that they're easier to solve in their totality. And I certainly understand why from a Lebanese perspective, you say there's so much going on domestically. We just wish we could have a clear set of American goals and actions that we can then deal with our complexity with. But from a US perspective, you're dealing with the complexity of Lebanon, the complexity of Israel, the complexity of Iran, the complexity of the Gulf states, the complexity of Europe, on and on and on. The level of complexity is completely overwhelming with any aspect of this. And then when you start combining it, it, it just feels tremendously complicated. And I think that the point that Will makes about sort of timing and opportunities is very apt that the time when you can really muster something is when people say there's a small window and let's align everything. But it becomes so much more than three-dimensional chess when you're trying to align different windows opening at different times to align the government in a comprehensive regional strategy. Desirable, sure. Practical, very, very hard. John, you talk about how difficult it is to make a strategy that can last the next four years. How do you expect Prime Minister Netanyahu will engage with the next U.S. president? Warily, it seems to me that for the prime minister, he is really focused on his own domestic environment first and foremost. And while Israelis care about the U.S.-Israeli relationship, I think they care more about their domestic environment. I think he cares a lot more about his domestic environment, I would guess that he's going to want to sort of stabilize the U.S. relationship rather than engage very much in it. And I think that principally he has been comforted by the fact that the Biden administration hasn't really been able to tie his hands either domestically in Israel or in terms of Israel's regional activities. And my guess is he would want to sustain that. He is more confident of his ability to sustain it with President Trump, who's more transactional, who's been supportive of Israel in the past, who doesn't really have an interest in conducting a broad regional strategy where he would sort of be micromanaging Israel, even directing Israel very much. With the Harris administration, I would guess that he thinks he understands the space he has. He understands pressure points he can use on the president and that a Harris administration would not circumscribe the things he thinks are very important to do in the Middle East right now. And, and as I've said in a number of places, I think he feels like every time he's defied his critics and taken risks in the last six months, they've paid off. And now is absolutely not the time to back off what he's doing. I do agree with you on lots of points there, John, but I do wonder if he might be feeling a sense of uncertainty about just how the next US president might respond to what Israel is doing. And there are lots of reasons to think that a future Trump presidency would be even more supportive of Israel as it was during the first administration. But whereas with Vice President Harris, I think it's harder to tell where she will land on this. I've have a hard time thinking that she would put a lot of focus into this in the start of her administration. It's difficult to tell whether she is truly completely aligned with President Biden on this, as she has said she is during the campaign, or whether she actually harbors some of the reservations that other Democrats have voiced in recent years. Zooming out a bit, 
What do you think great power competition means for resolving longstanding tensions in the Middle East? So I think the assumption is that more great power competition means more stalemates. Certainly, we have seen a lot of stalemates in the UN Security Council. We see no progress towards a solution in Syria, in Yemen. I mean, prior to October the 7th, there was no real movement on Israel and Palestine as well. But I do wonder if that might be slightly overplayed, the extent to which great power competition really shapes conflict resolution in the region. Ultimately, neither China nor Russia have seemed willing or interested in playing a big role in that. We've seen some Chinese efforts to foster inter-Palestinian reconciliation, but that doesn't really seem to have gone anywhere or done anything. Ultimately, it's still the U.S., Kind of leading that. And I do think there are various ways in which China at least would benefit from more conflict resolution in the region. And so although I think the fear is that China and Russia will just look to undermine the US in every opportunity that arises, I'm not sure that's necessarily the case. And even looking back at the Cold War, there were instances in which the Soviet Union and the US were not completely at loggerheads when it came to Israel and Palestine. I don't think everything becomes impossible. I think it certainly becomes harder. We certainly saw that with Russia's intervention in the Syrian civil war, which was intended to keep the United States from running the table in the Middle East in the wake of the Arab uprisings. China has a more interesting set of issues. I think you're right that China certainly benefits from a more stable Middle East. China has been hurt by the Houthi attacks on Red Sea shipping, which both hurt Chinese trade to Europe but also hurt Egypt, which relies on the Suez Canal and where China's put a big investment. But I think the idea of watching the United States squirm has tremendous strategic benefit in the eyes of Chinese policymakers. There really is this sense that if the United States demonstrates it can orchestrate global peace, that may be a bigger risk to China than messiness in the Middle East. Ultimately, I don't think China is willing to make a big investment to undermine the United States, but small investments to enmesh the United States in unresolved issues in the Middle East, to keep the United States struggling in the Middle East, I think from a Chinese assessment, advances China's interests more than China being an alternative to the United States, which I don't think China thinks it can be. I expect when there is some sort of international engagement on Palestine and the future of Gaza, I think China is going to expect a place at the table. China will proclaim its centrality, but I don't see China being anybody's savior. I see China being in the photos, China playing a role, but we still haven't seen China able either to do hard things militarily hard things diplomatically, or integrating diplomatic and military instruments to advance Chinese interests. I'm not sure they aspire to have that ability. And you could argue that the United States hasn't been successful executing it, but it's been more successful than others. And I think you're going to see the United States continue to try to do that. And again, I think that it will be in China's and Russia's perceived self-interest to ensure the United States doesn't have any big victories in that space. Thanks for joining me, John and Will. Thank you, Leah. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Babbel. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or Spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can find more analysis on this topic linked in the show notes on the CSIS website, and you can find us on Twitter at CSIS Mideast. Thank you.